Hi, Brenda. Hi, listeners. Welcome to the Overcoming Your Story podcast. Today we have Brenda Drinkham with us. Um, it's such an honor to have you. I'm so happy you accepted to come. So we dive right in. I will not make any introductions. I will let you introduce yourself in your own words. Then we pick it up from there. So please, Brenda. So I would say Brenda Drinkham is a Gabonese born Cameroonian and American raised Canadian citizen who is um, an entrepreneur, blogger, influencer, um, amongst other things. Um, I am the third of four children <laughs> from my parents. I love everything African. I'm very pro Africa, pro Africa, especially in terms of the culture and the fashion. And I am outgoing, but an introvert at the same time. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. You know, when I was trying to um, move to Canada, I was researching if there were Cameroonians here, how it looked like. And I found your, I think your Instagram and I found your website with your designs because you're, you're a fashion designer and you have a brand. I was like, oh, wow, I like what she's doing. If Cameroonians oh, wow. in Canada look like that, then I want to go to Canada. <laughs> Yeah, so it was a few years what? ago. <laughs> you didn't know this, huh? I didn't know. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So um so I followed you for a while. Um then sometimes I went off Instagram, but I knew about you even before moving to Canada because I liked what you were doing. I liked your how vibrant you were and how open you were about uh, many things. You said you were born oh, in Gabon. Thank you. I have no idea. Oh, you didn't know. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So you were born in Gabon and you're Cameroonian like me. So tell us, how did you like, how did you grow up? How come you were born in Gabon and all of that? My dad at the time was a diplomat and we moved around a lot. Uh, so he was stationed in Gabon when him and my mom had me. And two or three years later, we moved to New York where they had my little sister. So each of us was born in a different country, which is cool. Uh, so I was raised very, very multicultural, uh, well-traveled um, from a young age, thanks to my dad's profession. But my mom was a housewife for the most part. Uh, so she was on top of everything that involved the household and my dad would work, bring the money and my mom to make sure that school was fine, the house was fine. We always, there was always someone to take us to school, all of that. So that's how they decided to split roles and each person was fine with that until we finished school and now the roles have reversed. My dad is retired and my mom works. Oh, so, that's... <laughs> so that's how I was raised. That's amazing though. That's really amazing. Um, I know you spent some years in Cameroon, right? Um, in your in your formative years, I think. Yes, we did. We did seven to eight years in Cameroon. Oh yes. wow! Then then you moved to Canada. Yes, then I moved to wow. Canada. Wow, that's a lot of moving around. Um, so how did that impact you? Like, do you when you look back as growing up, did did you enjoy moving around so much? Did your parents prepare you for the moves? Like how, how did you see it as a child in your child? As a child, for me, it was always exciting, to be honest. Um, the only thing was saying goodbye to friends, but I didn't have many friends. I would have a few friends in each country. And funny enough, I'm still in touch with all of them. Uh, so for me, that was the hardest part, but it was also knowing that I'm going to explore a different country, a new adventure, the next country was always more exciting as you get to know it and the food. Being with my family, it was always fun um, because I do like hanging around my family. We're a fun group of people. And so just knowing that, you know, the whole family is going somewhere new was always exciting. The only time we weren't able to go with my dad was when he would go to war zones. That's when we would have to stay back. But like when he went to Angola, and Liberia. But apart from those, you know, it's, oh, we get to explore another country. Um, so for me, it was always exciting. And I think from that young age, I've always been able to very quickly 
in different environments, different scenarios. So that's why moving here was never an issue. I came here with just my my junior sister. And so we were just already so used to being, you know, well-traveled that it, it's always been easy for us to, you know, get along with people from all different types of backgrounds. Yeah. So when you moved here, how old were you? I mean, here in Canada. I was 16. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was 16 with your sister only the only both of you moved here for you yes my mom my mom had moved uh, but she was in montreal my sister and i we moved to ontario my mom lived in montreal and then my brother had moved here but he was at university in a different city so at least two of my family members were already in canada which was cool but we weren't in the same city so it was just my sister and i who were in the same city. So like, then how was it? Um, you moved around a lot, but um, Canada has been a more permanent home for you. How was it like settling in Canada, mm -hmm. living here longer and, and like getting used to living here? Was that easy because you had moved around or like, was it because 16 is kind of a challenging age because you're a teenager um teenagers like start to have like more mm -hmm. roots friends become more important you you know those relationships become really kind mm -hmm. of so how was it managing that when you arrive in the new place the move itself was i would say easy because we came to a boarding school here we didn't have to worry about lodging and food and all of that everything was taken care of we were just coming to study school everything was already paid for um, the only hard part was, as you said, a 16 year old trying to fit in, trying to make friends, or oh, you have an accent or oh, you dress funny, you smell funny. So that was the, the, that was the most challenging part was trying to fit in with, you know, look very different from me. And, um, at the time I was going through my own body, self-conscious, low self-esteem. I was extremely overweight at the time. So, you know, trying to fit in, getting made fun of because of my size, being bullied. That was the hard part. Like the actual moving here was easy. The hard part was now trying to make friends, you know, and figuring out the type of friendships I wanted to have, the type of people I wanted to hang around. Did I want to try and be a cool girl or did I want to be myself? That was the hard part. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's a lot to figure out. Um, yeah, and in a new place. But um, what I found really interesting in the way you present yourself in the world is that you're very authentic. You're very real. I like how you share yourself because you you don't pretend. And uh, um, I was reading about your um, weight loss journey. And I think there was a part where... <laughs> I think you're with your sister and then you decide that, okay, I don't want to be this person anymore. So how did that come about? Can you share a bit about that? Yes. The weight loss. I think that started uh, when I was 17. Was Christmas. We spent our first Christmas in Canada with my mom in Montreal. And I didn't used to take pictures often, but I remember my sister took a picture of myself and my brother. And I looked at that picture. I'm like, is this what I look like? In my head, I was like, okay, maybe a little bit overweight. But I saw the picture. I looked huge. I said, no, that's not how I envisioned myself in my head. Right after Christmas, we went back to boarding school. And I told myself, no, no, this is it. I am losing weight before graduation. Graduation was in July. So I gave myself seven months. I said, I must lose weight immediately and that's it's just my nature when i'm determined nothing nothing can sidetrack me i must reach my goal the thing is i start started off with uh, very poor eating habits i would do these ridiculous diets where i, I did the grapefruit diet the only carb i was allowed to eat was grapefruits that was, that diet made me weak and tired but i lost 18 pounds so it encouraged me i'm like okay so i can lose weight Two weeks, oh, wow. 18 pounds. I mean, it was mm. ridiculous, but it, it encouraged me to keep going. I'm like, okay, so my body can lose weight. 
try something else. I started trying so many different diets. I was exercising twice a day, morning and evening. I was in the gym. I was running around the block. That is how graduation came. I left from a size 16 to a size 6 wow, by July. Brenda. That's determination. Yes. I lost over 60 <laughs> I lost over 60 pounds in seven months. pounds in seven months. <laughs> yes, I was determined. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, but then the thing is with that, I became too obsessed with weight loss and I was counting calories. Like I was really, it was really, really bad where I would, you know, really monitor every single thing I ate. I was not enjoying food anymore. I was just eating you know, in order to make sure that I was staying alive, I wasn't enjoying food. And my mom noticed it. She's like, no, you don't look healthy. Like, yes, you look skinny, but you could see my collarbones were popping out. You could count the, the bones on my chest. It, it wasn't it wasn't for me. Like some people can naturally be like that, but my body was starving. And what happened was I went to university and the first year I gained 15 pounds and I was, I was depressed. I said, no, I just lost this weight. I can't get it. That's when I started now incorporating exercise, learning more about nutritious food versus counting calories and all this stuff. And I was able to learn how to maintain <laughs> the weight wow. loss. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I will come back to that. That's that's a really great uh, share you just had there. <laughs> um, bringing it back to childhood, um, we were in the room together on Clubhouse and, uh, and the room was tighter down. I, I didn't mm -hmm. have the mother I needed, I think. And you came in there and you shared, mm -hmm. I really like what you shared because you said, so it was a group of women, African women talking about their childhoods and their moms. And the, you, you, you encouraged us. You said mm -hmm. that you had your mom there, but you shared something that I don't know if you're comfortable mm -hmm. talking about. Um, because it's important. I think it's something that touches many African women. Yeah, no, I shared that I had the mother I needed, but it was the opposite of you ladies. So um, I instead did not want to disappoint the mother that I needed or make her feel bad because in my eyes, my mom was perfect. Up to now, it, my mom is the perfect mom, the perfect wife. Um, and so you know, growing up and having her run the household while my dad was working and, you know, not being able to be at home as much because she was also starting a business. And so she hired a tutor from our elementary school to come and be giving us home schooling. That was when you school. were back in Cameroon, um, right? And so, yeah, this was back in Cameroon. I was probably nine or ten maybe 10 because my older brother had already gone to boarding school. So probably 10 and my sister was probably seven or six. And so it was just my sister and I who would stay at home, with him, but we had known him for years. And so when it was just my sister and I who would stay with him, he would and my mom would leave knowing that ah, this is a whole, a teacher. She's leaving us in good hands. Teachers are well-respected. Oh, yes. So she knew that she can go off, run her errands with no problem. Yes. And so, you know, while he would be there teaching us, he would tell me, oh, come and sit, come and sit on my lap. Oh, let me grade, grade your, your work while you're sitting on my lap. And then, you know, he would start fondling me and sending his hands in places. And, the, and then he tells me, oh, you know, this will be our little mm. secret. And you think to yourself, okay, this is a teacher well-respected. We have a secret with a teacher. I'm special. Like, you know, it's like, oh. And he's like, oh, you don't have to tell your mom. And then you think, oh, wow, I'm really special. Something that I shouldn't tell my mom. This is amazing. But then at the same time, you feel like this doesn't feel completely right. But if he says that uh, it's fine, he's a teacher, it adds up. It makes sense. And so this went on uh, probably a year or two. Every time he would come, it's like, oh, come and sit on my leg. And then, you know, it's the shirt comes off and he's like, oh, that's fine. That's fine. You know, places mm. are hot. Like, you know, it's all this stuff. 
And it's only when I grew up, and when I say grow up, I mean my late 20s, <laughs> like mid to late 20s. That's when I shared it. And I remember I shared it on my, I think it was my Facebook page. I think it was my Facebook page where I shared it. And my mm. mom saw the post. And my mom was aware about any of this. And so she calls me. She's like, you shared something on, on Facebook. Mm. Who are you referring to yeah. in terms of the teacher? And I told her the teacher's name. Yeah. She's like, what? Why didn't you tell me? And then I stopped. I myself. I, I have no idea why. And I, as I mentioned in the group, if my mom mm. had known, oh, in, in jail, my mom mm. was well connected. She knew generals. This man's career, his life yeah. would have been over. She would have immediately believed me. Like, that's why I say my mom is like perfect. She would have never doubted if her child, you know, had any sexual assault claims, molestation claims. My mom would have been on it. So I'm like, why didn't I tell her? And that's why, like, I, I up to now, I don't know why. Because even in this, at this, my age, you know, she still felt as though she has to throw mm -hmm. hands, as if she had to fight <laughs> to touch her that's daughter. Sweet. But she's like, you know, why did I, and that's the thing, I, I can't explain why I did not tell her. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, it's something that also um, happened to me and, in our context, it happens a lot, especially it's always someone either in the family or a neighbor, someone we know. It's not someone far away, right? Mm. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you knew, you always yeah. knew that your mom would believe you. That's very important. And for you, mm -hmm. and also when, when it happens, the child always, we internalize shame and guilt that it happened, you know? And uh, yes. the confusion too, right? You, you were so young, you you couldn't imagine even something like that existed. <laughs> so it, first the confusion, and also the research shows that children never say what, when, when they are molested, when children are sexually assaulted in childhood, they never talk about most kids, like more than 90% of the kids will not say anything about it in during the childhood. So, mm. you know. So it's um, kind of, I would say, normal that you didn't say anything because the the shame and the guilt is so big that um, it takes years and decades sometimes to understand even what happened, you know, like what happened there. Yeah. So thank you. I hope your yeah. share will help and many young women, you know. My sister told me just only last year, she said that I'm back to the big sister she remembers. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, oh, when we were really young, I remember you being so outgoing. I wanted to be like you. You were running. You were, you know, always everywhere. And then she says, at some point, I don't remember when, you became an introvert. And she, I think that's not the big sister that I remembered as a little kid. And so we were going through it. And she's like, because, you know, she was aware of that sexual assault and then the breast ironing that happened to me and all these things. And then we were like, it just seems as though all of those things go into a shell where I was just, you know, the way and the way I dressed changed. I was wearing these big, loose clothing, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to call attention to myself. And so she's like, that's not the, the sister I remember, but she's like, no. Like this is the this is the big sister that I thought you were when I was a little kid. This is what she recalls of her big sister that she wanted to be like. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it takes it takes a long time to process. And uh, uh, actually, you said something mm -hmm. there that reminded me of uh, of the research on the adverse childhood experiences. Where um, how did they even discover? Um, so there was um, a doctor who wanted to know why women women who were overweight, when they entered his program and they started lo losing weight, some of them, like half of them, would leave and go gain their weight back. So through interviews, just talking to them, he discovered that the weight loss was not the problem, is that they were hiding. They wanted they, they wanted to avoid all attention from them. They, want, they don't want people to pay attention to them. So the weight was a way of mm -hmm. hiding themselves. And in questioning them, most of them had been through sexual assault in childhood. 
you know. Yeah, so they were trying to hide uh, in plain sight and and yeah, so that's how they started doing the research on adverse childhood experiences and uh, the consequences. So when you talked about um, hiding and changing the way you dressed and so it's it's all linked right and of course it dims your light because you had your personality you came to the world and you and you were fortunate to have parents who let you express who you were and then this thing happens to you and it just comes like a cloud over you but um now you talked about breast ironing before i had another question but you talked about breast ironing you never mentioned that do you want to talk a bit about that? Because it's a big problem in Cameroon. Yeah, it is a big problem. I remember um, on Clubhouse, a different room, uh, you weren't there. But it, the, the topic also came up of breast ironing because we're talking about female genital mutilation. And so breast ironing, um, some people may or may not be aware, is the act of suppressing the growth of um, a young girl's breast and the reasoning behind that is usually to avoid uh, male attention. So they believe that once a girl starts showing physical signs of maturing, it attracts the unwanted attention of men and can bring along early teen teenage pregnancy. And so once mine started to grow, my grandmother <laughs> decided to start the process because she had done the same thing to my mother, so it was tradition. And so that's why my grandmother, who was staying with us at the time, decided to also start ironing. So, yep, in the morning, I would wake up and she would have a hot and she would pound it, pound it, pound it on my chest. And I'll be shouting and crying for my own good. And it was just so traumatic. I'm so sorry that happened. Um, I remember in Cameroon in school, um, I did not understand at the time, but I saw young girls who wear like these plastic bands on their chest, you know, to suppress, mm -hmm. as you're saying, the, the breast. But you could, so for some of them, the breast had already grown and you could see the band and they could see that the breast was underneath. So I noticed it, but I, would, I wouldn't say anything because you could, they didn't want to talk about it. But I did not understand at the time. I did not know about breast ironing and I did not understand at the time. So thank you for talking about this, because in our country, this concerns a lot of people. But Brenda, oh, yeah. with all of this, so how did you find your voice? How did you, because today you're very outspoken. Um, <laughs> I'm an introvert, so I know you have an, this introvert side, but you also have a very, you know, you're very outgoing. Uh, you're funny. <laughs> you make a short videos that are really very funny uh you have a huge followership on um on instagram on on social media mm -hmm. so how did you as your sister says how did you find your light back how did you how did you find yourself honestly it, it was being in the western world that really helped me and not the you know not institutional education it was the education that i was receiving outside of school, hanging around people who were themselves and wondering how come I can also be like that. It was honestly just this, what they say, street education that really helped me going through magazines, reading blogs, learning that there are other people like me out there. It was all of this knowledge that I was, you know, tapping into thanks to the internet and learning so much about, oh, this happened to me, this was wrong, but there are women who have gone through it and look at them doing amazing things. So I thought to myself, huh, why not me? Like, ah, especially, and I won't lie, after the That's weight amazing. loss, the and it increased my confidence. In the beginning, no, because I felt as though, as you said, you know, you lose the weight, but you still have this cloud over you. But I think um, with the weight loss and then compounding it now with this new knowledge that I was receiving from the internet, it helped to boost that confidence. And, you know, just friends and strangers saying, oh, you really look good in these outfits. And it's like, oh, people think I'm pretty. Oh, people think I'm funny. You know, just getting these compliments from strangers who don't owe you anything. It's like, oh, so maybe 
I'm actually talented. Maybe I'm not, I know how to dress. So getting that, you know, feedback and confirmation from people, it really helped me to break out. And then I would share a little bit and people would say, oh, thank you for sharing. And then you share a little bit more and people really like how honest you are. And you're like, oh, people like this. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what really helps me. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I really like what you share. You share um, You share yourself. It's, it's really amazing. Um, yeah, I had a question, but when I when I hear you talk, I just forget. I just forgot my question. Oh yeah, <laughs> about the fashion. I know that uh, I remember one time you shared how s- some of your photos are taken and then they they're used on billboards in Nigeria. I found that so funny. <laughs> I'm famous in Nigeria. And I don't even yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So about mental health, how do you take care of your mental health with all of this? If I may ask, have you like ever been to see a therapist? How has been your mental health journey? Generally, um, my mental health is usually between eight to 10 on a daily basis. Uh, I mean, in my adult age as a kid, I wouldn't really know, but uh, I have never gone for any sort of personal therapy, except for when I was dealing with um, the loss of a friend that was for grief. But I've never had a therapy outside of that. I'm pretty good with resting. I'm really good with self spa days, mani pedis, massages. Just, you know, I'm really good with that, with checking and taking care of myself. I am um, I don't know where it stems from, but generally I'm really, really good with that. If I need days off from work, I'll take the days off from work. I don't care. I don't care how busy it is. I always take care of myself. I prioritize myself. And so with that, I've never had um at least in my adult life, I've never I don't believe I've ever been depressed. I, I have, may have been sad for a little bit here and there, especially when um, my closest friend passed away. That would probably be the only time I would say I was at a two or a zero. But apart from that, it's, it's I'm, I've been really stems from the fact that I really have a great support system, mm-hmm. both in terms of family and friends. People really can count mm-hmm. on people who really understand what mental health is. I mean, not so much my parents, but my siblings, yes. My, I mean, my closest friends, yes. Um, it's been really easy having those conversations with them. And I find that I, I tend to be one of the strongest in the group mentally. I like even sometimes might be going through different things. I find that I'm more of the person who is encouraging them uh, versus the one receiving just because I'm really, really good with my own taking care of myself. Like I you tell from my social media, I don't like stress. And yeah. I, I work hard to enjoy life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I, want, I like to enjoy my life. <laughs> <laughs> I love hearing that. I love I really love hearing that because um coming from our context, um, there are many things that we were taught to be or not to be right a woman as a woman should be this we should do this we shouldn't speak about this you cannot talk up in public about this and what i like is that you're very real about what you share you don't share to to make other people believe something about you it's you just share your journey as it as it comes like the day to day and like how did you find your voice in that way because you have a very powerful mm. voice you know from what you were taught to who you I are. I didn't realize how. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry, I think there was a delay. Yeah. <laughs> that um, I didn't realize how powerful my voice was until after I started getting, you know, maybe thousands of followers. And it's because at first I thought people were following me just for the fashion. And a lot of people, you know, they get a, they get pulled in with the fashion of the clothes that I'm wearing, but then they stay because of the, the content, the captions. And I, I've been sharing this in my story. Some of the testimonies I've been getting from people who I don't know from anywhere, who 
have been following me, who just started following me, and they stay because of the content. And I didn't realize that so many, you know, quote unquote influencers, they're not open, they're not sharing, they're just showing. And a lot of times now we want to be able to connect with someone in some way. And so I like being that person. I've always been that person, my friends and my sister. And so just that's, it's, for me, of my community, my close knit community. So that's why even, you know, I always call my followers, my community members is like big community this sisterhood whereby if that these are the conversations that we would be having and i have no problem with it whereas you know a lot of people you're one person on social media and then another person in life it's like no it it just came to me naturally i am in my circle of friends that these are the things that i talk about with them so i've been very blessed to have the circle of friends and then the things that we talk about are things that a lot of people would talk about but they don't have these people to talk about it with. So when I talk about it with someone who doesn't talk about it with, she feels heard. And all of a sudden they start pouring out, they start commenting, oh my gosh, this happened to me too. I'm going through the same thing. Realize, I know it really, really struck me when last year I posted about, you know, an abusive relationship I got out of and I posted it on my birthday. And the response was just, Today, I haven't gone through all the comments. I, I, I just had to just, <laughs> it was so overwhelming. Hundreds and hundreds for like two, three days, women were sharing their stories with oh, me wow. about abusive relationships and, or, yeah, or just being in relationships with men who were not pulling their weight and who were slackers. And then they were just waiting somewhere to yeah. vent. And I provided them the space for them to yeah. bend and they felt heard and seen. So that's when you realize, okay, a lot of us are going through the same things, but we just need a place where we can talk about it. And they don't maybe want to talk about it with people who know them. They might feel judged. And so here comes Brenda, <laughs> who speaks her mind, and they feel as though they're more than welcome to share. And Brenda will, you know, will be able to go back and forth with them. And they feel yeah, <laughs> no, that's really amazing. Um, yeah, coming from our context where, as you said, these things, um, I, we are not encouraged to talk about what's wrong, how we are feeling, if we have uh, relationship issues, yes. um, if we are dating the wrong guy. Everyone will say, no, you, you found someone, you have to stay with him. You know, you, you have to get married at this age. All of these taboos yeah. and 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 dogmas that we have as uh, as women and so i can only imagine the freedom it is for these young women when they come to your page and then you're so real because it's true from the way you present yourself you could be just be telling them that you're so perfect your life is so amazing you could just be doing that right without trying to connect with them um but you don't do that you you connect you you share um, I mean, you share all your the facets of your personality, and it's quite amazing. Um, I remember you were sharing about, I think I don't know if it was yeah, I think about dating. You know, you share you share your experiences with dating. Some of them are funny, some of them are less. But I find that so refreshing that you know, being a you know a fellow Cameroonian to see you. Um, be so open with 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 your life and your experiences you know so um i don't know if you have any something what would you like to tell our listeners like the young cameroonian women young african women young black women out there on how to find themselves on 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 that journey to connecting to themselves mm. i would say a really important step is to try and find your tribe your tribe doesn't have to be family um, because, for example, my parents are not big on this whole mental health. As soon as you say mental health, they think you're crazy, you're mad. Like uh, you, they, you need a psychiatrist institution. They don't understand that. And so I found my tribe, you know, my sister and friends that I've made who, you know, think like me. And your tribe doesn't have to be people that you. There's so many platforms right now 
that have so many communities where you can find support, even Clubhouse, <laughs> where you and uh, met. Yeah. There, there's so many communities and rooms where you can you be heard and seen. That's a very important step. And another thing is there's so much power in sharing, so much power in sharing because you, uh, there's people who relate to what you're going through and there are people, even if they don't relate, can support you to what you're going through. But no one will know anything unless you share. There's so much power in being authentic and sharing your story. Uh, people like to put up a facade, you know, be it on social media or in real life. Once you are vulnerable, there's so much strength in that and so much that we take for granted. And yes, some people might look at you funny. I will lie, some of my friends from Cameroon, when I started off, oh, Brenda, you shouldn't be saying that. You shouldn't be sharing all of this. That's not right. Ah, you, I share my fibroid story. Oh, you know, we don't talk about that. Some men may not want to marry you because they know that you have fibroids. Then that's not the man I want to marry. Like, do, do, there's just so much, you know, darkness around sharing, especially from in certain cultures. So you can't share this. You can't share that. Share what you want to share. Those who you have a problem with it, they'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> they can go ahead and live their own life. You can build your own community. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Be- <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, because it's your life at the end of the day. So share what you want to share. Thank you so much, Brenda. That was an amazing conversation. Um, yeah. Maybe we have a part two or three in the future. We don't know because I feel like I, I, there are some there are so many things I would like to pull out of you. I <laughs> You know, so, but uh, thank you for this first conversation. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome. <laughs>